I saw it when I was a kid, and, and it, it, it actually stayed with me as if it was a nightmare because I remembered some images isolated, but I, I didn't remember what the movie was about because I was very young. <laughs> and I just remember being horrified. And, and, and it stayed, for me, nightmares are in black and white. So that, that stayed. But what I, what I thought, what is curious is I didn't know the story behind. And again, in my early youth, I read I Am Legend and I thought, oh, this reminds me of, of Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> but you, 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 you were inspired by it? or I was inspired by it. I read I Am Legend, mm -hmm. and I thought, wow. But, you know, I said, this starts when it's over. Yes. And I, I'd like to see what happens in the beginning. Yes. And do something, you know, from the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, I mean, I, I shouldn't say unfortunately, because... Everything that has happened with Night of Living Dead has been incredibly fortunate for me. Yes. But I never wanted it to be a racial movie. Mm -hmm. I never thought of it as a racial movie. Did you have any feelings when you first saw it that it was about race? Well, in Mexico, uh, the, the, in Mexico, we, especially in, the, in me growing up, we had a very different upbringing because it was, uh, there's a, there's, I'm a mestizo, I'm half sp Spanish, half uh, Indian, you know, we, we, we don't have that conception of, un, until you are older, you get that notion of the world. Yeah. But what, I, what, what struck me uh, was the ferocity of it. It was really a very fierce film. <laughs> because, and, and what struck me is that the hero died, for sure. I, I, but I, I think that you, I mean, I think we create movies and then 50% is what we want to say and 50% is what we say without knowing. I really believe that. I think that's ex uh, ac actually true because I certainly was not saying some of those things. Yeah. But uh, in, well, they in, were in, in the air. No, you in fact, uh, you know, the hero, you, you call him the hero because he's the, obviously, he's the guy you're rooting for all the way, except he's wrong. Yes. He is wrong. In the end, he's wrong. But, but his hero because he's the smartest guy in the room. I mean, everybody talks about diversity now, uh, and I, <laughs> you think about Night of the Living Dead, and you have a, a charismatic, super smart, super wrong. Is <laughs> 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 a leading man, let's say. Yeah, so yeah, good. that's a better description, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, you gave birth. I think it's uncanny because. I don't think uh, it is often that you can trace the, the birth of an entire genre to a filmmaker. I mean, the fact that th when I argue about The Strain, for example, I tell them, of course, all vampire films that are a plague are like zombies because zombies are like vampires <laughs> because of the birth. But you, you birthed an entire modern genre entirely by yourself with that movie. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know how it is. You just don't even think that way at all. You no. come up with an idea and you say, okay, but a big, but a big, but a big, and then people read what they want to read into it, and mm -hmm. that's it. I mean, I, 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 I still to this day, I mean, I, I remember. Um, uh, I don't know, other Carnival of Souls, and I, I remember other yeah, films yeah, for sure. that came first, uh, or that came were around the around same time. Around that time. And, and um, so I say, why me? But um, listen, I love the idea that I'm credited with this, but I don't think that I really deserve you, you, you do. Sadly, you don't admit it, but you okay. do. Okay. I, I tell you, right now, you, you, you deserve the credit. You created it, and I think that you gave voice to an entire, to an entire, uh, the anxiety that was in the air, for sure. Whether you did it consciously or not, you were responding. Obviously, you, you were a left-leaning man, right? And you were a young, wild bohemian. <laughs> <laughs> so you were rebelling against the man in a in a natural way, and you've always have. I mean, after death, all your movies are completely progressive politically. They all are. Well, what was happening at the time was that there was all this racial tension. 
uh, and and um, we never thought that our film was about race in any way, even though I knew that Dwayne was a African American, and I knew that. Uh, this was maybe going to make some waves here and there, but I, I never, I never calculated. I never calculated that, and, and uh, it, literally, that we had the answer print, the first answer print of the film. We were driving to New York um, to see, to show it to people who maybe would distribute it, and and. Uh, that night in the car with the first print in the trunk, uh, we heard that Martin Luther King had been uh, assassinated. So now all of a sudden, it became a racial film. Yeah. Nothing that we intended. I mean, it, it was just all of a sudden, you know, magic. It was one of those things. It's like, yeah. it's like you know, uh, it's, uh, we, were, we were talking earlier. It's like the China syndrome. You make this little movie, and all of a sudden, Three Mile Island. Three Mile Island, and you know, that, so it was like that. So. Now let me ask you though, uh, and, and and the answer may not fit the theory, but uh, casting to this day, casting is always contentious in any movie, big, small, whatever. I imagine it was quite laid back that you said, "Well, I want Dwayne to to be the hero, the leading man, whatever," or was it? Or did it take any convincing to any of the partners? You know, it did, except uh, not very much convincing because when uh, I, Jack, Jack, Ru a friend of mine, Jack Russo, and I wrote the script together, mm -hmm. and we thought of him all the time. And if you read the original scripts, we, there's no description of the guy, uh, and as far as his color. Mm -hmm. um, and he's a truck driver, and that's it. And in fact, he's written as kind of a gruff, um, gruff uh, you know, not good, not good grammar, not you know. And, and um, so Dwayne was the best actor from among our friends. And Dwayne auditioned, basically auditioned, <laughs> and I said. Wow, I mean, this guy's much better than anybody that yeah. we've seen, mm -hmm. and so forget about it. He gets it, and that was it. And all he did was change. He wanted the dialogue to be not so gruff. Yeah. He wanted it. He wanted it to sound a little more um, uh, sophisticated, uh, gra gracious. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, and that's all he did. You know, it's it's like. Uh, you know, it's it, it's like the script set when he reaches for the phone. The script says, "I guess you tried this," and he he read it like, "I suppose you tried this," uh -huh. and you know, so he made all these little changes to try to make him seem seem less, try to make make the character seem r less rough around the edges. What what is great is that he also brings a lot of poise and uh, and a lot of gravity and a lot of. Uh, Command. I mean, he he truly is an exceptional leading man. I mean, <laughs> wrong as he may be, because because he he makes decisions that 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 he seems to have thought out, and and I think that that's why it hurts so much uh, when he dies. For, for me, as a young a young kid, it was one of the <laughs> biggest shocks I've ever gotten in a movie. But but to to a visceral degree, I I just said it cannot be. I felt. <laughs> Sort of a, the ending is so apocalyptic, probably at that level, because every everybody that you have rooted for is dead. Yeah. And now here's the last bastion of of uh, decency, you may say. And and because I I find uh, very very purposely you make the guys doing the hunt rough. Oh yeah, they're they're cowboys. They're yes. they're completely rednecks. <laughs> yeah. The and hunt. I think and I think that's that's where I think. You've always had, I mean, we know that directing is managing choices. Whether your choices or, or the weather or the budget, yeah. right? <laughs> or whatever, or the producer, that, uh, but you manage. And when you manage, you imprint who you are and your essence. And you've always been 
uh, have have an anarchistic an anarchic streak in you, and the the natural choice would be to make the army the savior, to make uh, you know to to balance the characters different. So that that runs through your movies, through all the dead movies and every other movie. You you see Martin, and when you see Martin, you make uh, the vampire the good guy, <laughs> right? And the church or the power of the church is good guy. Well, <laughs> a, a little bit, a little see, bit of just, blood I drinking. I like to sort of thread that very narrow. Eh? Thread that line, and I think it is a narrow line. It's always a narrow line, even out on the streets, right? Yes, it's yes. like, who's the, is this guy a bad guy or is he just? Uh, um, anyway, I, 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 vote, I, I prefer, I, I don't know, I, I, uh, I, it's hard for me to write white hats and black hats. Yes. Uh, because I see a lot of the white hats that I've known are not necessarily white yes. hats. Yes. And a lot of the black hats that I've known are not necessarily black hats. And pro so. Probably the only movie where, where, where it's stated in a much more uh, dichotomy is Night Riders, oh. in a strange way, right? I mean, where you definitely have a, a, a world that deals with idealism. I'm and so a world flattered that you know all this stuff. Well, I know all that <laughs> stuff. I live that stuff. But Night Riders has, I mean, has that, that, that sort of... Uh, a, a translation of the Arthurian ideals, no? But to a place that is... Yes, but is he a good guy or is he a... A, a madman. A, yeah. Is, he, is it Jim yeah. Jones with yes. a bike? Yes. <laughs> That's what you mean. That's what I meant. And, and is, is, is that what he is or is he really a good guy? I don't know. I mean, in the well, end... You, ca you cast that Harris. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that leans it one way, right? <laughs> you cast me as the, as the king. The whole movie wobbles. <laughs> well, I don't know. Ed, see, at that time, Ed had only done one movie so yes. far. Borderline, I think it was. Mm -hmm. It was um, something about the coyotes in in. Uh, yes, it, for me, it was the first time I saw him. You saw Ed. The first time. Yeah. And and uh, that's all I had ever seen him in, and I, and uh, everybody was pitching him as if as if he was handsome, yet has its air of danger. And so <laughs> my wife found him handsome. Okay. I remember we were dating back then, and I, 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 every time he would show up in a movie, she would say, "Who's in the movie?" I said, "The king." And she go, "Let's go." And she never knew his name. I would just say the king. You're and kidding. Like, no, no, absolutely. Oh, man. Oh, I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> but see, I think that's what I, I was saying. I think that there is part of your craft and part of your storytelling takes place in the dramaturgy of it all, right? The writing, the blah, blah, blah. But another instinctive one is in the casting. Duane or Ed Harris as the king is not Tom Sabini as the king. Obviously, instinctively, you, you, you know that there's a more <laughs> mischievous side you know, I knew the dark side of Tom. Yes, but <laughs> and it sort of you could ignore the dark side of Ed. But uh, um, no, I, I, I listen. I appreciate what you're saying there, but um, you, you, uh, sometimes you don't have that choice. Sometimes it's not you making that choice. But you have the choice of not making that choice. You have uh, the choice of saying screw this. Well, right. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> What I find interesting in all your filmography, and I think that, I, I mean, I knock on wood that I think I've seen everything, uh, is that you're, you always uh, take a point of view that is unusual. Uh, you know, as we said, the vampire, when you do Martin, uh, you have incredible leading, leading uh, parts for women. And uh, well, whether- Not in the first. No, so not on not the first film. Not the first film. <laughs> no, but eventually you do. And, <laughs> and, and let's talk about uh, There's Always Vanilla. <laughs> well, it, it, how did you arrive to that movie as a follow-up and, and exactly what was the process of it? Well, you know, it's a very strange... Uh, um, we, I, we had a friend who was an actor. His name was Ray Lane, who was, actually plays the lead in... Uh, there's always vanilla, and we we shot 
a short film, a short film as an audition piece for him mm -hmm. to go out and try to sell himself. And that was it. And uh, my friend Rudy Ritchie, um, since passed, um, wrote a script and he kept not delivering, not delivering. And after Night of Living Dead, we had money, not a lot of money, but people were giving us money and we needed to finish the film. And so in the end, the script wasn't ready. And I wound up, I wound up writing narration, dreaded Sometimes. narration, in order to sew it together. And that's really, the, uh, that's really what that film is about. So it started and as I, a I short. Huh? It started as a it demo. It started as a short film, an audition piece for the actor, for mm -hmm. Ray. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we decided to expand it into a feature. We thought it was, you know, it was the days of David and Lisa. Yes. And you could do. Yes. Great movie, by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A and uh, that's what we, that was our, that's what we aspired to do. A and. Uh, that was it, but it sort of never came around. And, uh, so you were you were looking for a very day, sort of everyday yes. movie. I, and, but I think that the curious thing is you you bring that sense of very day to the genre. You bring it to Knight. You bring it to Martin. I mean, there's a lot of haphazard stuff. You do it. You do it very consciously on Martin when he's dreaming his. Uh, vampire ideal uh, reality and then everything turns out to be disastrously every day. I mean, he opens the door and the woman has yeah, cream on her face and so forth. So, <laughs> so, so, and you bring it, I can, I can quote you a few, a few instances in, in the movies. And you bring this sense of approaching a genre from the ground. You don't approach it from the lofty position of a genre. I mean, the grimy details on Night of the Living Dead all of that, so I think you are the the you bring the verite into horror. Well, <laughs> I'm not quite sure I know how to respond. In the case of Martin, uh, I I knew I in my in my head he's not a vampire. In my mm -hmm. head he's mm -hmm. a messed up kid. Yeah, uh, and been influenced because. He happens to have this fucked up grandfather who was, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and he's just been warped into this. And I think the images that, the black and white images, I wanted the whole film to, film to be in black and white. Mm -hmm. Now, I think it's better that there are color sequences. I'm black and white. Um, now, I mean, back then I was, and this is what you were talking about these decisions that you make, or you think that it's your decision, but it's really not, because somebody says, you know, I won't distribute it. I mean, I had, I had uh, when we shot Monkey Shines, I had, you know, uh, I didn't want, I, ha I thought I had a terrific ending for that movie. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you Mike, Me it. Mike Metavoice, at, who was head of the studio at the yeah. time, said, oh yeah, you want to use your ending? I'll open your movie in flight. Wow. And that, I mean, quote, bing. And <laughs> nice guy. <laughs> nice guy. Yeah. And so, you know, this is this stuff that I've run up against. When you say, you know, you're, you're are now in a position where you can make decisions and, ha and have a, a certain kind of command, which to I'm sure point. you didn't have initially. Yeah. Around the, uh, in yeah. the days of uh, Kronos, or <laughs> yeah, well, I had the I had the lofty position of not having money, <laughs> so there were no no pressure, you know, there there was no money. No, but I think that there is some there is some stuff you've done that is that 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 still gives you that backbone. Setting the movies in Pittsburgh, I think that is a recognizable reality. You know, it, it, first of all, it, look. Richard Madison did this for the genre in literature. He brought the fantasy that up to a certain point, I would say at least un until the end of the pulps, used to happen in castles or planets in a far, far away land, right. you know? And he brought it to suburbia and to urban reality. All of a sudden, I Am Legend was happening in a city with everyday things that were recognizable. 
you could have uh, shot in Pittsburgh regretting you were in Pittsburgh, trying to make it look like anywhere USA, but you embraced that, that even although they were genre movies. Yeah, but you know what, man, it's where you are. So did, uh, so did Sam Raimi. I mean, it's like, so did John Waters. I mean... Uh, I would it, agree on John Waters. Yeah. Yeah, but I think, I, 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 I think that I, I've been in Prague shooting a movie, uh, going, emailed back and forth to the studio, them saying, can you make it look like New York? And I go, why? <laughs> it's Prague. Let's take advantage that it's Prague and enjoy Prague for Prague, right? Without also making the point, oh, it's Prague, but you, 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 you can embrace, it's a decision. And I think, I think uh, you could have left for Hollywood, you could have done uh, the same uh, scale of budget in another place, making them, uh, Hitchcock said, if it happens anywhere, it matters nowhere. You know, he said, uh, the, the place the story takes place in is as important to the narrative as the main character. It is, Mount Rushmore. <laughs> it, well, Mount Rushmore, or if you make Vertigo an anonymous city no. anywhere in the U.S., I, you know, which is what, what I tell you, the, the, the decision is made every time with Euro co-productions co in the 80s, in the 70s, where you see Europe and it's passing for anywhere in the world right. and, and it doesn't have the same flavor. So I think that there is, there is a, an idiosyncrasy to your stuff that comes from there. Well, you know, thank you for um, saying that, but you know what? It, it's, I think there was just so much garbage out there. Mm -hmm. when, when I was, you know, first sort of watching films and there was garbage. I mean, it was all exactly what you were talking about. The sci-fi films were cheaply made and, uh, you know, ex exploitive and, and and the, and uh, the, the romance films were three coins in a fountain. You know, it was just it was just so obvious. It was just fabrications. Yeah, and I don't know. It was very easy to say. Well, I'm not going to do that. Um, easy for you, morally yeah. or artistically. Well, easy for me, and you know why? And exactly, you said something earlier. I I had the blessing of no money. Exactly. And, and I was able, and I found, eventually I found a guy, Salah Hassanen, who, who financed after, we had no distribution for Dawn in the US. Mm -hmm. And so we wound up having to, what we did actually, my ex-partner Richard Rubenstein said, we'll set up a screening, one screening took a one-inch ad in the New York Times, Dawn of the Dead, so, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, sequel to Night of the Living Dead, bing, and an audience showed up that absolutely packed the theater. Mm -hmm. And distributors came, and one of these guys was Salah Hassanen, who said, you know, said he wanted to distribute, wound up did distribute the film, uh, left it unrated, which was terrific, which I think it helps yes. in the end. And, and uh, that was it. And then he gave us, and you never get this. I'm a young filmmaker, you never get this. The guy said, I'll give you a three picture deal out of the blue. Amazing. And so I said, okay, as long as one of them is another dead film, and so, and the other two then were Creepshow and Night Riders. And mm -hmm. I would never have made Creepshow or Night Riders except for that guy. Wow. And, 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 and I think that the, the, you, and there you created a second involuntary genre, which was the Italian zombie movie. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I didn't create that. <laughs> Some other guys. <laughs> yeah, but but. Fulci, Fulci. But that that led uh, <laughs> to the connection with Argento in a way, right? Sorry. Is that what led to the connection with Argento for Don? No, Argento came first. Oh. Argento came first. I I. Guillermo, he, the, I I. 
for years, 10 years, I, everybody had been bugging me to make a sequel to Night of the Living Dead. And I said, I, I didn't want to do it. And so I socially knew these guys that developed this shopping mall, the first shopping mall that anywhere in Western Pennsylvania, the first indoor shopping mall ever. And I said, they invited me out to look at it, and, I, and they were, the, the trucks were just coming in, bringing in everything that you could ever want. And I said, this is really worth something. Because I, I didn't want to do, do a sequel tonight unless I had something to say. And now I said, oh man, this is something to say. Yes. And I had already started, I had already started to write a script, and Dario called me up out of the blue, completely out of the blue. Called me up, got the number from my agent, and he called me up and he said, George, I, I, you want to make another night, moon, dead moon? And I said, you know, so happens, I have I an idea. And he said, he immediately sent me airline tickets. I flew to Rome and I wrote that script in Rome, near the Piazza de Popolo. Oh, wow. oh, well, <laughs> As one does, <laughs> but but the the beauty is that there is, like there is some some ideas that you left unfinished in Dead, and in, in Night of the Living Dead that you grab onto for crazies, which I also adore, you know, and uh, and which may be the the real root of the strain for me. Oh, you know? uh, is this idea of uh, of a massive m movement to counter the um, this is not me, by the way. Yeah, 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 I forget. George is a okay. <laughs> He's called Dario. He's, 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 he's getting he's pissed. Alleged. He's getting pissed. He's a legend. He's taking enough of this. Ask me a fucking question. No, uh, so, uh, you know, the, the idea that there is a whole organization pushing against the plague, uh, there, is, uh, there is some beautiful, crazy, no pun intended, images in the movie. And I think with that, you have, you, 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 you upscale the apocalypse, and then you show um, sort of very pointedly, now that you told me the shopping mall, <laughs> where it came from, <laughs> but very pointedly, you, you tackle the, the army, consumerism, blah, blah, blah. And, 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 and I think uh, it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a beautiful existential uh, idea there that is we have everything, and we're not really alive on unless we have adversity, unless, yeah. right? And that's the beauty of well, the I know, ending. the characters, all of a sudden, when they, when they have it, in that brief moment, when they have it all, mm -hmm. they're dead. They're dead, <laughs> yes. And, and, and when they lose it all, they're alive. <laughs> so that, that, now, you, you may avoid uh, responsibility during <laughs> the entire interview, but those are absolutely <laughs> anarchic choices, which are beautiful. You know, those are... And regardless of how haphazard was it for you to stumble upon the shopping mall and so forth, to decide that's the arc of the characters, not the reverse, which is they end up getting to the mall. That's their Oz. You know, the beautiful is they get there, they consume everything, they use everything, and then they go, there's nothing. There's nothing. Yeah. They're barren, right? Yeah. I, I, I love that I love that about it and, and then the explosion at the end uh, detonates that and they end up in a helicopter with almost no gas. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's almost like a Jean Pierre Melville existential. Yeah, really, ending. man. Yeah. But you know what? It, that's the only the only I in the original script, I kept thinking of it the whole time we were making the film, I thought this has gotta be a sequel tonight. Therefore, Everybody must die, and it has to end tragically. And only when we were shooting the film, we actually shot, we actually shot footage of uh, Fran committing suicide in oh. the helicopter, standing up into the helicopter blades. And oh wow! We didn't, we didn't, act, we didn't shoot the effect, but we shot her getting off the, the footage. Yeah, and. Uh, that was what was in the script. And, and, and then I said, I said to myself, wait a minute. 
what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that the world is fucked. Doesn't mean that everybody needs to get fucked, you know? I mean, I can save a couple of people. The world will still be fucked over there on the left and... and they live. They live. And so, and that was it. And I said, you know, okay, well, maybe they don't have gas. So... Beautiful. <laughs> that was... <laughs> But that, that, I mean, I love, I love the, the idea of this, again, this pulsion in Knight Riders, how does the king die? In the most mundane, against the most mundane object in the world, you know? Is you have Arthur riding <laughs> heroically. I know, finally uh, yes. thinking of himself as <laughs> the white knight. And, and what happens, George? Oh, he gets clobbered by a truck. <laughs> I mean, yes. you know, he just is lost in his, he's lost in his, uh, in his dream, in his, in his, uh, in everything that he ever wanted. He's lost in, in everything that he thought he had created. He's lost in that. He's lost in Wonderland and uh, loses sight of reality for a and moment. The but, yeah. but I venture in a strange way, this is something you have lived. I mean, in your, in your life, as a filmmaker, like we all do, we are riding in our motorcycle and we <laughs> run into the truck of distribution <laughs> or the studio or something. I mean, but there is, there, is, there is something quite personal for a filmmaker to decide on that, on that fate, you know? You know, I, I, I suppose there is, and I have to say, that in, in all the films that I've made, it's my, Knight Riders is my most personal film. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because of that, it's because of that. Because I, I spent my life trying to convince people to join up with me. Mm -hmm. Let's do this, we can mm -hmm. make a film. We can make a mm -hmm. film right here in Pittsburgh. We can do this, we can, you know, uh, being, we, uh, I, I, that was my whole thing, let's. And I know that, some people came along because they were thinking, well, movie's cool, you know. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody had the, except for a couple of guys, Russ Streiner and, and uh, Jack, we were the only guys that had the real dream, had, mm -hmm. had the dream in harness. A and, um, you know, so that movie grew out of that because it, it grew out of, all the people that said no, all the people that said fuck you, all the people that said, mm -hmm. you know, that's what that movie grew out of. And, and, it, and it grew out of, of uh, also, I had, I had some um, problems with, with some of the guys, Jack and Russ, and you know, they, they didn't, they, don't, they wanted to go into a different company, the ones set up their own company. And so I, I felt betrayed and that also comes in. That comes to, in the movie. Comes into that film. But it, but it, but but the beauty is that you're saying every director is an aspiring Jim Jones. <laughs> 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 Ultimately, you have to convince a lot of people that the Kool Aid Maybe. is really good, right? <laughs> I know, but I, I would I would distribute Kool Aid that was uh, yeah beneficial. <laughs> yeah, no, but 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 I think I think that that is that is I think present in most of your movies. There is the the clash between the genre and the reality. And, and you benefit from that because, because the mundane reality informs the outlandish uh, elements of the film. I mean, even in Dawn, there is a, there is a m mundane level to the shopping mall. Uh, there's, a, a, of course, there's a wish fulfillment. Everybody in the audience, I saw that movie the first time I saw it. <laughs> Midnight screening at a mall. Wouldn't this be great? <laughs> no, no, but, but we were in, in Orange <laughs> County. We had gone to Disneyland, and the whole family was retiring. I, said, I looked up at the, at the paper, said, Midnight Screening, Dawn of the Dead. I say, I know what we're doing. <laughs> My brother and I go into, into the screening. We come out into an empty shopping mall. And not only did, did it look creepy, which it did, <laughs> but everything looked kind of tacky. And everything looked kind of mundane in a non-aspirational way, <laughs> because you take you you took us all the way through that journey. Okay, this is 
oh, we can have everything, joy, then we don't want that. I mean, I think, I think there is a real beautiful uh, spirit in that. You know what, Guillermo, when I first went and saw that shopping, when I first went to visit, this guy proudly, the guy that I knew socially proudly said, I'm developing this f first indoor shopping mall in Western Pennsylvania. You gotta come out and see it. The moment I saw it, and I'm telling you, the trucks were bringing in. Fantasyland. Everything, everything, everything you could ever possibly, you know, Americans could ever possibly want. And I said, what is this? I, I mean, I, I'm not a, a religious person, but I was reminded of scripture. You know, what does it benefit if you have everything, everything. in the fucking world and you lose your soul? It was a, a Babylonian. Yeah. Yes. It's like, uh, and um, it blew me away. And it's what gave me the idea. And it's that idea stuck. And I think that that's what's in the film, basically, all the way through the film. It's like, this is ridiculous. You know, now, now part, of, part of the way we understand the genre is a Judeo-Christian way of understanding the genre. And, and more pointedly than any, any other way is the Great vampire. Segue. No, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. But, I'm sorry. <laughs> and and, and more, more than any other genre, the vampire genre uses it. And I think that uh, one salient example on how you don't deal with this uh, absolutes of good and evil in a spiritual way is in Martin because if if what you're saying is the essence of it the, the grandfather's madness religious madness creates Martin creates this aberration in him and and ultimately the ending is tragic because it fulfills the fantasies of both characters and and religion is not seen as a saving grace in your movie Boy, I think that I, I, I put the uh, stomp, I stomped on religion with the character that I played in that movie, which was a priest, mm -hmm. who was just more interested in the sweet wine yes. than in uh, why he's there. Uh, and the exorcist, the, eventually this exorcist, who is this octogenarian guy who doesn't even know what he's doing, is just yes. reading the... The, and and it, it, to me, that's what religion is. Yes. It's, e it's either rote, it's either something that somebody reads by rote, or it's uh, misinterpreted in, uh, anyway, I, I, I don't, I, I'm obviously, I'm not a religious person <laughs> at all. I was raised Catholic. And uh, I, 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 I lapsed uh, the moment, I, I, I can remember the moment. I mean, I, I was, uh, my, uh, my grandmother died. And I, I'm, I don't know, eight, seven, eight mm -hmm. years old. And uh, we all went to the funeral home and, and we're walking home. And I said, because I had been taught, well, at least, She's in heaven now. Uh, and, and oh, oh no, I'm sorry. My uncle said, at least she's in heaven now. And I said, not necessarily, because I'd been taught that, you know, if you committed a sin right at that wrong moment. You went down. You went down. Yeah. And I got whacked. At an existential level. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, no, physically. Oh. I got whacked physically. Your, your uncle. All around, yeah. <laughs> my dad, my uncles, everybody said, get out of here. And um, uh, so it was that moment that, that uh, I, I said, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. But rarely, rarely the, the, the divine or the supernatural ever has a role in your movies. I love, for example, the, the, the priest, the brief appearance of the priest in, in, in Dawn. In Dawn. When he comes out and he's such a compelling, tragic figure. Yeah. You know, is, 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 is at the same time has huge authority, but he, he's lacking a leg, right. literally. 
He doesn't have one leg. <laughs> one leg to, to stand, stand on. Yes. <laughs> so, so there is, there is a pathos to that, you know? There, and, and the religion in Martin is completely, uh, how would you say, poisonous. It is. It I, is. I tried to do that. I tried to. I mean, they, they, were, there, they were trying to practice the altar. It's a, a TV that, you know, with a, with a cloth draped over it. And that's just, oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> But, but I think that, that you, if you have any faith, because at the end of the day, I think you are, you are a filmmaker that, that struggles between hope and despair in all the movies, between the truck and the king riding the bike, <laughs> basically. But if you have any faith, it's in a few uh, men, in a few people, uh, uh, and, and very pointedly uh, uh, female uh, characters, you know? I think that, that uh, in, in Dawn, uh, one of the strongest, most centered characters is female. Uh, I think that the, you have very strong female characters, gay characters, and so forth, and Knight Riders, really uh, uh, quite, quite beautifully, three-dimensionally portrayed. Uh, and in Day, uh, you have probably my favorite female leading lady you, you created, yeah, w which is a fantastic character, a, a true humanist. And, and and it seems to me that you always say, I against barbarism, there's always one person that stands to reason and for the good of others. Yes, but you know, uh, Sarah, for example, in Day, Sarah, mm -hmm. the character of Sarah, who survives through it and, and uh, in the end could just as have easily have been shot just the way John Amplis is shot by uh, the Rhodes. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, it's, it's by the seat of her pants that she survives. Mm -hmm. I don't think that she does anything. In fact, to merit? To, uh, not to merit, she does, she merits everything, but we, a lot of us merit reward. And get shot. And get shot. Yes. And. But you've done that. Yeah. <laughs> again and again. <laughs> it is hope that is the rare That's Romero rare. ending. <laughs> I know, but my God, you mean I left, I left a ray of hope. <laughs> You did. You didn't look. You didn't look under the rug. There was possible salvation. No, but I, but I think that that uh, nevertheless, you do have uh, these characters that are not. Uh, that, uh, there's such beautiful extremes in day. It, it is probably in many ways the most addictive of the death movies for me. It's the one I rewatch most often, and 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 there is there is beauty a in the because for. Is, is, is truly against the big institutions. Science is crazy, military power is crazy, so you, you, can, you can actually manage to humanize the zombie, <laughs> you can actually manage to do Baba, which is an incredible creation, <laughs> and, 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 and you, you then say, against the, the rock and the hard place of the military and the scientists are people that are trying to make a living and be decent, <laughs> you know? So I think she's a tremendous heroine in that. Because she goes toe-to-toe -to, -toe to one of your most extreme villains. Oh, she does, yeah. <laughs> right? She doesn't I know. back. I know, but so does the crazy guy. I mean, so, yes, yes. so does... Dr. Frankenstein. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Frankenstein yes. stands up. He's the first one to yeah. stand up. But, oh uh, boy. Listen, I, uh, I appreciate all of this uh, analysis. It's not analysis. But it's actually just the fact that you have a definite profile as a narrator. And, 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 and there is no lack of merit for a man to, to express uh, his beliefs through art, consciously or not. Every choice you make carries that anarchy to, to the last movie. Well, you know what? Every choice you make when you have the position of being able to make the choice. Mm -hmm. 
And I know that you've been there. I mean, I know that you've been in positions where before, when you were what what you are today, mm-hmm. you know, when you when you you're you're uh, trying to make choices and you're arguing for something and it doesn't come out. But I, and I think the most important thing that you said is when when you can say when you say no, mm-hmm. I. I think that's the only, the biggest thing that I can take credit for is that I said no, mm-hmm. often. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's it. But you know, because it, you say, well, this is that. garbage, I'm not going to mm-hmm. do that. Mm-hmm. And that's it. And, 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 and you, I mean, to me, you are, uh, seriously, to me, uh, and I've said this in interviews many times, growing up by two formative figures were you and David Cronenberg. Because you were you were men that were working in the genre, with principle. You you and him are both men of principle, and both of you to me stand as 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 guys that created a completely articulate, coherent uh, world, artistically, politically, and I always thought. These guys stick to, to their guns. And the most, uh, ev- ev- people think a director is this, a director is that. The most powerful weapon a director has is no. I, and, and you used it. Yeah. When the time came, you, you said no to many, th- I, 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 it's not that many times that people say no to you. It's, it's, it's oh, a, yes. <laughs> it's, no, but it's, 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 I, I tell you, oh, yeah. when they finish screwing, <laughs> no, but it, it's uh, no. It's a word that people in power use a lot and can't understand. They don't hear it enough. So when you when you stick it to the man, so to speak, <laughs> through your narrative, uh, growing up, you and Cronenberg were the salient examples of what I was hoping to do in the genre. And and the first time I met you, it was like meeting the Pope in Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh, we had dinner there. <laughs> And and I called you Pope for a while. And you were again. already, weren't you? What you had uh, drawings already. Was yes. it for Hellboy? It was for for Hellboy and Pan's Labyrinth and all yeah. that. <laughs> but but what what I what I think is important is that you guys have a body of work where you have never betrayed yourself, uh, socially, artistically, politically, and you, as we said, the the most powerful tool a director has is not just creation, but saying no to, to the to the evildoers of the world. And I think you have to give yourself uh, credit for that because not everyone uh, remains pure at that level. And, and you, you've been always an inspiration. Well, thank you. I mean, I needed to say that before the sex. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was the foreplay. Yeah, thank that was you. the foreplay. I true. have said no. Yes, <laughs> yeah. very important. And George. so have you. Yes, I have. So <laughs> and, and you can only say fuck it once yeah. in every project. Oh, you mean oh, in certain company? Yeah, no, no. You, I mean, you say fuck it two times, they don't believe you anymore. You know what I'm saying? You can only say I'm leaving or I won't do it. Really? I thought they just no. put you on a blacklist. I said, do. This guy doesn't cooperate. I, yeah, well, I was going to have that phone call in a few minutes. But, but uh, you know, the, the, the other aspect that is interesting, I think, is the relationships between men and women in your movies are all interesting. They are relationships of power and intelligence, and they are often purely at a human level without a sexual element to it. You know, there, there, is, there is some beauty and equality between male characters and female characters in many, many of your movies, uh, and that's another rarity in, in the genre that you don't often resort to sex. When you do, it's really interesting. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. namely, namely, I think, other than the casual nudity in Night Riders or uh, here and there, you know, there is a beautifully painful, sick, gorgeous, <laughs> tragic, poetic <laughs> sex scene in Monkey Shines, which is also a movie I love. So uh, what did you, uh, how did you come to that? And it defines the character so well. Well, in the case of Monkey Shines, I felt that I couldn't leave it alone. And I felt that I, I was, uh, I don't know, I, I, 
uh, I felt that, you know, here's this guy without his limbs and uh, I, I just thought that it was a nice way for her to show her affection. And uh, I, I also thought it turned out to be a particularly sexy scene, mm -hmm. even without anything explicit. Uh, you just see reactions. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was the one, one of the only, I think the only time that I expressly went for that. And other, other than that, I mean, I, th I, I never had, I never thought of, of uh, the characters in Night of the Living Dead as sexually having any potential. Uh, I, they were purely human in that way. Yeah, I mean, and I think that you're right. I mean, I think that that's, and maybe underneath somewhere, that's the way I'm thinking of it. I, I don't it is, want that to interfere with the the actual uh, human relations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I, and and there is there is some nudity in Night Riders, uh, but I, I I but I don't think I don't think that's an energy. There is no sexuality and that this is another this is another thing where you it was an eye opener for me on Martin is the first time I saw uh, a vampire narrative where the sensuality of it was not really in play it was it was a messy uh, sad exercise right. drinking the blood that that is seminal for me for the strain blade chronos whatever you name it that movie uh, th it, it told me you can do that genre without having to have a suave man in a cape. And all that. So that is that is a very intentional with, withdrawal of that. Because I'm sure the distributors or certain partners of you were insisting to to show them the money. Well, yes, they were. <laughs> I, and I, there is a, a moment later in the film where when he uh, when he breaks into the the uh, the suburban house oh yeah finally yes and you finally see this you see this woman jumping out of bed with 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 a guy and she's completely naked full frontal nudity and you know i and uh, that was sort of my way of saying what does this matter this doesn't matter right now she's in trouble and you know i just thought it was the way to show that was exactly full frontal. No. And the rest, not for any kind of... Uh, Exploitation. Uh, yeah. And, there, and there's, there's a beautiful image of, uh, of, of the, the, the woman with the slit wrists uh, right. in, the, in, the, in, the, in the bathtub. In the bathtub. Which is just so sad and so poetic, you know? Well, I know. I mean, it's the only, it's the only sort of. I mean, Martin actually felt some sort of love, mm -hmm. or some sort of uh, a f uh, felt something yeah. for this woman, and, and you know, all of a sudden, bada bing, and then he gets blamed for that. Yes, which uh, is which is which is a very again <laughs> such a sense of tragic <laughs> injustice in your films. Yeah. See. He gets hit by the truck yeah. for the crime he, he did. He, he for does. the crime he didn't do. Yeah, it's like the it's like the postman rings <laughs> twice. You know, you know, <laughs> always rings twice because he 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 gets destroyed by the one that he didn't kill. Right. You know, but I think that is the is how inflexible the world is as a as an object for you. I mean, I truly where is the military, science, the truck. They are immovable objects against which your idealists, uh, because I, at the end of the day, Martin, as arranged as he is, is more of an idealist than Tatakura. He's, he's doing it with, with a certain lofty ideal, oh. whereas Tatakura is a repressive, horrible no, presence. No, he is, yeah. and he's telling the truth all yeah. the way. I mean, there is no magic. <laughs> there is no magic. And uh, anyway, I know. but. Oh, Guillermo, thank you for noticing all these things, but... Uh, and thank you for eventually accepting some of them. <laughs> <laughs>